on the ship, the steamship, saying goodbye is my Aunt Helen and Uncle Charner. And Helen has her bouquet on from her marriage. And um, they're, they're aboard ship saying bon voyage to the Coulters, the senior Coulters. My mother, my grandmother was a, um, was a daughter of uh, German background. Uh, not directly. Her family came west as school teachers and arrived in California. And she was born in 1866 in White Flat, where her father was a school teacher. White Flat is right near Columbia, the old historical gold rush town. So they are early generation Californians. And Harriet Hostetter, uh, and I'm sure they must have dropped the F somewhere along the must have been Hofstetter when they got here, and then a few generations, the F disappeared. And she was supposed to be a very practical woman, and Coulter was supposed to be the artist, the whimsical, impractical, you know, devil-may-care guy. It's, it's not exactly clear. They were both quite religious. They were both active members of the church, Star of the Sea and Sausalito, the Catholic Church. And it, maybe that's one reason why I left Ireland, too. Lived in the wrong end. I don't know. Yes. Why so many pictures of Babcock? He liked it. <laughs> there, I've, seen, I've seen as many pictures of the Erskine Phelps and a few of the others, but um, I suspect <laughs> that uh, somebody saw one and said, will you paint me one like that? And it was probably a scene of the gate and as they began to sell. Uh, if you want to see another good picture, and I don't know if it is the Babcock, almost the same Golden Gate scene appears in the boardroom of the Chamber of Commerce of the city of San Francisco. And uh, there, there are Golden Gate scenes all over. Um, you want to say a little, a little something about the prices of these paintings? People might be interested or might be asked about this. The prices of the paintings. Um, well, if you want a Coulter today, there are two for sale at the North Point Gallery. Excellent paintings, duplicates of paintings that'll be in the show. The East Port and the Empire. And I don't quite understand because I've heard them quoted as $70,000 each or two for 150,000, so I must have that wrong. Uh, <laughs> There was a Coulter at auction at Harvey Clark's about a month ago, and it did not sell. Well, I presume. I'm going over to see it tomorrow. Um, I don't know what the reserve was. I couldn't tell you, but they had estimated it at 4000 Yeah. Um, now... Well, that's hard to say. Uh, I think he sold the, um, I think he sold blue light for several hundred dollars. Oh, God. <laughs> I apologize. I just let it go. Uh, it'll shut off. Uh, there, I, I, talked to a lady who had a Coulter painting who was um, told me that her father bought it for her mother as a anniversary present in 1928 and paid $65 for it and it was a painting on artist board which is not stretched canvas so it would have been it was a little looser than many of the paintings you've seen here and it would have been maybe uh, 15 inches high by 24 25 inches wide and when he painted his sketches for the newspaper, he got $5 if the newspaper used them, and he got to keep the sketch, and he could do whatever he wanted with it. He would frequently sell little paintings on the street corner as sort of a street artist, maybe for 25 bucks or something like that. Uh, I heard, and I'm not sure, and I don't know if Clint has any... Uh, uh, information that he got several thousand dollars for each of the murals. As a matter of fact, I, I glossed over something. Uh, does it say there? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that Liz did the uh, research on that. Liz Robinson, by the way, who, who uh, 
really wrote that book. Well, my dad wrote the book, but Liz was, Liz was his conscience and his guide. She was an archivist, and she also kept him trying to funnel him away from stories back toward facts to be sure that the, the dates were right and things like that. Um, but I think he, 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 he was able to, you know, sell that burning the blue light and, and get to Europe and back and spend a year, something like that. Uh, he, he, it, it's hard to tell. I mean, he painted for such a long time, and he painted well into the Depression. I wanted to say something about the Alaska Packers, too, because they're very important to the sailing fleet. Uh, the Alaska Packers kept going long after any sailing vessel had any reason to be sailing, other than the fact is they took these vessels up to Alaska in the spring and they brought them back in the fall. They made one round trip over which was a fairly short distance by ocean going standards at the time. So he had this subject going for him and there were many, many Alaska packers. They take a small uh, experienced crew and then a lot of fishermen and canners that would help them with the sailing. And so the Alaska Packers, which eventually were all named Star of something or other, Star of Alaska, Star of uh, Bengal, Star of Biscay, and other star ships, uh, kept sailing back and forth out of the bay and gave him subject to paint right until his death. Anything else? Thank you. Thanking you all for participating, and I'm just thrilled to see this exhibit. Of course, it's been a dream of mine for a long time. But the guy that has really put this together and is responsible for the whole thing, the selection of the paintings, um, the mounting of the exhibit, and the writing of the catalog, and more about that later. We have a few more people. Oh, <laughs> I don't know you. sorry, I'm Tom Coulter. I'm the grandson of William A. Coulter. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce Marcus DeCherio, the guest curator of our exhibit. And Marcus is going to fill you in about the art. And I will be around for questions or little sidelights about William A. Coulter and his life. Marcus is. Uh, got a long history in maritime art, so he knows a lot about what's here and a lot more than I do about all these paintings. So, Marcus, why don't you start out? Hello, welcome to A Master's Brush with the Sea. Uh, William A. Coulter was one of the greatest practitioners of maritime painting, in my opinion, that ever was. He is unique because he is the sole practitioner or maritime specialist who painted on the West Coast during the last half of the 19th and first part of the 20th century. Uh, American maritime painting, of course, was established pretty much on the East Coast, and most of the hierarchy of American marine painters are East Coast artists. On the West Coast, in particular, we were very fortunate in San Francisco because we had William Coulter capturing what is essentially the history of the development of maritime endeavor on the West Coast and as such, the actual growth of San Francisco itself. Coulter's paintings are very unique to try and display. Mostly when I have done exhibits before, you try and do a chronological progression. In Coulter's instance, he spent entire decades where he didn't date anything. So we see the sporadic date here and there. In order to give the exhibit some form, I chose to do different styles or different, not periods, but uh, different themes. We start out with embarkation in County Antrim, Ireland. Coulter was born in Ireland in 1849, the year the gold rush began in San Francisco. He was born two weeks after the California, the first gold rush vessel carrying uh, miners to the gold fields arrived in San Francisco. And he's born a week before the first sailing packet, the John Cater, arrived from New York, carrying passengers from New York to, uh, in response to the gold rush. 
So Coulter's story is entwined exactly with the history of San Francisco's development as a maritime port. So we're going to start to walk through here. Some of the paintings that you'll see are like the first one on the wall there behind Tom. Coming home is one of Coulter's most favored views. That's looking west to the sunset. Always this theme pretty much generates the end of the voyage or the safe return to the harbor. Uh, this is one of the nicer examples uh, with the beautiful coloration, of course, and Fort Mason or Black Point is there on the left of that composition. You'll see this theme and several themes repeated throughout uh, Coulter's body of work. So on this wall, what we have beginning here are paintings from Ireland. At least on two occasions, late in his career, once early in his career, once late, Coulter went back to Ireland, painted views of places that he remembered, places where he grew up. And the first part deals with Ireland. <clears throat> This is Dublin Harbor. This is the quay at the River Liffey with the Bark Matty, which is typical of the Irish famine ships uh, departing Ireland. The peninsula in the background is called the Howth Peninsula. Just behind it's a little island called the Eye of Ireland, but it's kind of, it doesn't really matter. It's just something I found in doing the research. By famine ships, do you mean? Excuse me? A famine ship is that when they would take people uh, aboard it to take, get them away from Ireland? Yes, during the famine there was a great uh, migration of people primarily to America. And this is just typical of the type of vessels that did that. This is a small portrait we found of Glenarm Harbor, which uh, Coulter lived there from seven until the age of 13 when he finally went to sea. Below that is Carrickfergus Castle, which is on the northern bank of uh, Carrick Fergus Lou on the way to Belfast, I believe. North of Belfast. North of Belfast. Yeah. This is a, an example of Coulter's ship portraiture. And it's a, a ship portrait, again, it's everything the owner wants to see. It represents the vessel usually in a profile or a beam view. This is the Star of Aaron. And Star of Aaron was the vessel that his brother commanded for many years, and on Coulter's visit to Ireland in 1878, he painted this for his brother, who again commanded the vessel till he actually died aboard the vessel sometime in the late 1880s. And this again is in Tom Coulter's collection currently and has descended through the family. The Martello Tower, London Dairy, I found that interesting. The tower still stands there. Those were shore coastal batteries. Uh, developed uh, by the French in 18, about 1812. There's about six of those in Ireland. And this is just an interesting view, uh, especially because, again, the tower still stands. The lower picture, these are called the Maidens. Those two lights mark a group of nine rocks uh, in Ireland, near Island McGee, where Coulter grew up. The lugger here could very easily be making for, the, uh, for Island McGee. This is a pen and ink drawing done uh, in Ireland, we believe, uh, on one of Coulter's later trips. As we get to about this point, the focus needs to shift to the other side of the gallery here, where we begin with a city of ships. Each of these paintings represents a specific vessel, with the exception, the only exception that I made to the chron chronology is this painting up here of the Bark Brignardello helps us to date Coulter's arrival to about 1868 or 69. This bark uh, was wrecked in uh, summer 1868 and stayed on the beach until January 1869. So it is believe Coulter has actually viewed this vessel and at some point had painted it that helps us date his arrival. The primary piece here is one of my favorites because this deals with so many different types of vessels uh, and maritime activity in San Francisco Bay. We have felucas, brigantines, pulling boats, a bark, tugboats, three-masted schooners, steamers, sloops, two-masted schooners, full rig ships on the horizon. This more than any other image shows all the different types of marine activity going on in San Francisco Harbor. These two paintings are impressions. The first one is of the Golden Hind. 
The second one is the San Carlos. The Golden Hind, of course, was Sir Francis Drake's vessel. Coulter never saw these, so these are his impressions of what he thought they may have looked like. And pretty much every marine artist there is can give you their own impression of what they thought they looked like. San Carlos, of course, was the Spanish packet, the first uh, vessel into San Francisco Bay. This wall is all classic ship portraiture. The five-master Falk Attend, which was launched as Flagstaff over in Oakland about 1917. The lower picture down here was a challenge for me. I first got the photograph of it. I was trying to figure out who and what it was. I spent about two months researching this painting. Turns out this is Matthew Turner's first Tahiti packet. There are a couple of very interesting aspects about it to determine that it was, in fact, the Nautilus, which was the first Tahiti packet that Matthew Turner built. <clears throat> The style of the vessel, the tall pole mast, the ring tail, and the very long boom, pretty much that was something that Turner developed. This one has a single topsail instead of split topsails, which came later. It's also dated 1874. In 1874, there was only one vessel like this sailing, and it was the Nautilus. The Tahiti packets all flew the French territorial flag on the foremast, the American flag on the mainmast. Then I noticed this one's reversed. This is not the French flag. This has the, the red panel on the hoist and the blue panel on the fly. That makes it the international code signal letter T. International code signals are only flown in pairs or more. They're never used as a single letter. T for Turner. Whether Coulter did that or whether this is the fact that the Nautilus was the only one of the Tahiti packets that Matthew Turner himself commanded. Uh, is unknown, but my speculation is it's Coulter paying tribute to Matthew Turner with the T instead of the French flag. After I did two months of research and I picked up the painting and brought it in to hang, I discovered the name Nautilus is written right on the stern. So, <laughs> <clears throat> that is the easy part for a docent. This, in my opinion, is one of the finest examples of Coulter's ship portraiture. This is Glory of the Seas. It's uh, painted 1873. It depicts her arriving in her November uh, voyage in 1872. Again, it's a Donald McKay crack clipper. The influence of the Liverpool School, Coulter was a seaman in the British Merchant Service for about seven years, and he would have visited Liverpool quite often. The dean of the Liverpool artist was Samuel Walters. This is very reminiscent of Walters' style. In the park, library at Fort Mason. On the upper floor, there is a painting of Glory of the Seas by Samuel Walters. I suggest you all look at that and compare these two styles. This, again, is very early. This is 1873 for William Coulter. And again, I think one of the finest of his ship portraits. The detail in it is just exquisite. Again, here, this is Glory of the Seas, 1872. Here we have Glory of the Seas, 1906. Owned by John Barnison, Captain John Barnison, the Barnison Hibbard Company. There is a very interesting comparison. We will get to what I'm sure you're all aware of, the fire painting and the depiction of what is believed to be glory of the seas in that painting. If you compare this with the vessel in the fire painting, you will see, yes, it is almost for certain glory of the seas that has been depicted. Below is another version of the coming home theme. Again, a beautiful view, Used, look, looks like about from Meg's Wharf, maybe somewhere in North Beach, vessel coming in in the sunset. The vessel is the William A. Babcock, which was a Sewell line vessel. The Sewells of Maine commissioned Coulter to paint most of their vessels that uh, visited the West Coast. The Babcock came into San Francisco Harbor no less than 11 times, so it made quite a few passages from the East Coast. There are quite a few Coulter paintings in collections in Maine as well because of the, this connection in particular. We move here across, it's another Sewell line vessel. This is actually the Edward Sewell. Beautiful delineation, very well portrayed off the Farallon Islands. I mean, the sails are just full of wind and light. The sea is just perfect, makes me want to go sailing. I mean, it's just a great image. 
The next painting here is the Three Brothers. It was known here in San Francisco as Big Brother. It is unique because that is just one incarnation of the oldest surviving side wheel steamer hull in existence. This was built as the side wheel steamer Vanderbilt and was the flagship of Vanderbilt's Atlantic line. In the late 1870s, let me read my own notes here. Yeah, early 1870s. 1873, she was bought by the Howe brothers of San Francisco. There were three brothers named Howe. The vessel was renamed Three Brothers from Vanderbilt. They took off her side wheels, took out her engines, built a clipper bow on her, gave her a clipper rig. She became the largest merchant sailing vessel, vessel in history at that point and proceeded to break clipper records under sail going around the Horn and going to Australia, to the East Coast, and to England. She survived as a coal barge right up until 1929. So this hull, which was originally built in 1857, was the longest surviving wooden steamship hull in history. Next painting is of the Drum Muir. This was another vessel identified by your house flag uh, owned by Barnison Hibbard or Captain John Barnison. Uh, one of my few errors is here. The signal flags on the jigger mast, I actually identified that as a mizzen mast, which is incorrect in the write-up here because I was too busy and I did not count masts. But the interesting thing here is this vessel is solely identified by the house flag of Barnes and Hibbard and her coat hoist on the jigger mast, which correctly identifies her as the bark drum muir. On the wall behind us, or across here, there are two paintings next to each other, the Empire and the East Port. These were pretty much built for the coal trade, the Coos Bay coal trade. They would bring coal from Coos Bay to the Bay Area. The Coos Bay was the primary coaling area to supply coal for the steamers uh, operating in San Francisco. They were owned by, I think his name was Fitch or Fritch, and he had a brother who was an operator on them. So there is another pair exactly like this, uh, actually here in a local gallery in San Francisco. So there were two sets of these paintings known to have been painted. And it's believed Coulter got a kind of a commissioning boon and was uh, able to paint one set for each of the brothers. That's undocumented, but it makes a pretty good story. Are, are these sisters? Excuse me? Are they sister ships? No. Uh, one was built on Coos Bay, I believe the Empire. Uh, Empire was built Port Madison, Washington Territory. And the other one was built in Marshfield, Oregon by Hans Reed. Most of the data that I'm giving you and much more, I can't remember everything I wrote, but if you read the catalog and read the captions, you'll get most of the information. I'm just going by memory at this point. <clears throat> this is a very spectacular painting of the bark Andrew Welch coming across the area known as the Potato Pass Patch on Four Mile Bank. As we see pictures of uh, Point Bonita that Coulter painted, you'll see two versions, one with the second lighthouse built low down that does help us date in some cases, but usually a lot of the older ones have the first lighthouse, which was up on the point. Because it was so high, it was constantly enshrouded in fog, and the vessels kept saying, we can't see it. So they dropped it down onto the lower promontory where it still is today. All right. Below the Andrew Welch, we have the three brothers again, same vessel in the picture on the far right, uh, coming in off the Farallons with little pilot schooner number three. That is the George Peabody, the Boston pilot boat that came out here. Um, and again, as I mentioned, there were three Howe brothers who owned the vessel, and there are, the vessel was named Three Brothers, and there are three known portraits. The third one of which is coming up at auction next month and is probably going to set a record. <laughs> Kailani, the last documented American vessel to operate under sail. Coming in, again, we have the low lighthouse on the promontory here from Hawaii. Uh, this is when she was owned by, it's a Hawaiian company, and I'm sorry, the name is escaping me at the moment. The house flag, again, identifies her owner. There is an identical painting of this 
vessel in Maine, everything exactly the same except the backdrop is Diamond Head in Hawaii, uh -huh. vessel coming in. So culture would paint many, many versions. Uh, this again is uh, one of my favorites. It's just got so much atmosphere and the color is just gorgeous. It's a beautiful day to go sailing. Next is the bark J, I'm sorry, the three-masted schooner J.M. Coleman off the Fairlawn. J.M. Coleman is typical of what was the pretty much the heavy working vessels in San Francisco and carrying lumber and cargo throughout the Pacific Rim. Uh, they were easy to handle. Very few crew were uh, necessary because of the fore and aft rig. The Coleman is a very famous wreck down on the Channel Islands now. She uh, <clears throat> went aground off Santa Barbara Island, I believe, and was uh, total loss down there. Um, <clears throat> but again, just another type of vessel that helped uh, San Francisco become as important it was as it is as far as uh, carrying cargoes. The owner of that particular painting prefers to play it safe, and it has been glazed. Just, this one goes to exhibition a lot. It's owned by the Kelton Foundation in Los Angeles, which is actually my day job. <laughs> the Luralene here was the first of the Matson uh, vessels. Uh, again, Matson lines. Coulter had a very long career painting Matson ships. Uh, several of these are Matson vessels that are painted actually after they were working for the Matson line. So again, we have the Luralene, the first of the Matson packets. Below is one of my favorites. That's just, it's a little light draft harbor freighter called the Mount Eden. It was built by a guy, the guy who owned it, Captain Barron, built Barron's Landing over at Mount Eden, which is today downtown Hayward. And it just carried cargoes between Mount Eden and San Francisco. But it's a beautiful portrait. And the owner of the vessel commissioned it and Captain Barron owned both the painting and the vessel. Kind of give our tribute to steam here. <clears throat> Another, the last command of Captain John Barnison was the Arizona. During the uh, Spanish-American War, 1898, it carried troops and cavalry and horses to the Philippines. The spectacular Harvard, a magnificent painting. The vignette here on the right shows the Sutro Baths, the third version of the Cliff House. The Pacific Beach, or I think that's the Pacific Beach Pavilion is also in here, and Sutro Heights is still evident. It's painted about 1915. Yale and the Harvard made, I think, four uh, trips a week between Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco. Mile Rock, Fort Point, again, it's a very interesting perspective for Coulter going into the bay instead of uh, from outside Fort Point. So exactly where he was here, he might have been in a boat, he could have been somewhere out on Point Bonita, but again, just a beautiful perspective. Another Matson vessel, the Matsonia. I like this because of the very beautifully depicted city front. There's, uh, you know, the architectural rendering here is another facet of Coulter's talent. Now, behind you, we start a new section. <clears throat> I call it the visual narration. This is Coulter telling a story, or Coulter as a chronicler of the waterfront. The Lee Shore on the left, a very well-known painting, hangs here in the Maritime Museum. This is Coulter portraying adversity at sea, but also providing that ray of hope. You know that vessel's in trouble, but she's going to make it. And it was a theme throughout Coulter's painting that he never wanted to portray a vessel that was just gone, that was just not going to get through. He always wanted to give you the idea that there was a chance that it was going to make it. But he did paint some pretty precarious situations. In this one, you see the main top gallant's been blown out, and she's got some rocks to get by, and she's being blown right down on them. But you all know she's going to make it. Now, this uh, painting is of the Tug Storm King towing the Golden Gate through some rather adverse conditions. Both of these are Rolf-owned vessels. They were owned by Sonny Jim Rolf, who was uh, mayor of San Francisco, of course, and then later he was governor of California. This painting is still in the, in the Rolf family. Uh, uh, Mrs. Welch, who is the descendant of 
of Sonny Jim told me that James Rolfe really believed that nobody would ever spend any money to ship by steam when the wind was free. <laughs> I would have agreed with him at the point. And this one pretty much needs no explanation. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the story behind the 1906 fire and this particular painting. Coulter painted it probably from the upper deck of the sketches done from the upper deck of the uh, Sausalito Ferry going back and forth during the evacuation, which is the largest uh, maritime evacuation prior to the evacuation of Dunkirk in World War II. Uh, certain discrepancies uh, can be pointed out, but I don't. I just prefer to look at the painting and enjoy what he did. We do have what is undoubtedly the glory of the seas here to the left. However, I'm also pretty sure, as I have a painting in one of the collections I take care of, of a vessel called the Servia, whose logbook says that she was also in the harbor. I believe that's the Servia off the stern. Some of the other vessels have been tentatively identified, but primarily I think Coulter was just trying to get the story across. There is not much I can say about this painting, except I'm sure that you're all aware it was painted on a window curtain that was pulled out of uh, the dramatic version of the still smoldering rubble of the, of the earthquake. Uh, it says window shade, but this is actually linen, and I've never seen a linen window shade, so it is, we call it, I call it a curtain. Geography. Happened tomorrow. Question about geography. Is this Fort Mason over here, and this is Telegraph Hill here? Telegraph Hill. It's called the Fort Mason, I think, would be a little, Black Point is a little bit farther down here. Like I say, supposedly. That building here, Paramount? Yes, and this is the Humboldt Bank? And That's the call building. The call building, okay. Which has actually moved. The call building belongs over there. Right. So it's there is some here. perspective. Right. One interesting facet is that Coulter worked at the San Francisco call. He is portraying the end of his career as a news front reporter right here. The last time he did a, a news article was this one. This one, just as it's happening right now, is going to generate a lot of discussion. People are going to, well, that should be over there. What's this? What's happening? I was there once. You know, it's just, that's what's great about it. You leave as many questions as you do answers in a successful exhibit. <laughs> You're going to have to look at these as you come by. Again, we have more uh, steam vessels here. Little Salinas on the bottom. Another. This was actually uh, it's owned by Matson. Here's a good version of the lighthouse up on the point instead of on the on the lower promontory. Salinas is said to have entered San Francisco Harbor more times in the 1880s and 90s than any other vessel afloat. Above it, we have the Pearl Shell, which was a very early oil tanker. Uh, at the time, this is a completely new type of vessel, and again, Coulter captured uh, an oil tanker uh, probably the late 1920s. The pilot service, pilot vessels, we have the HF Alexander coming in almost for sure. That is adventurous, uh, pilot schooner 15, longer side, although we can't see the one on the sail. The five is prominent. We do have pilots in the water in the yawl boat. They've probably just put pilot on board the Alexander and coming back to the adventurous uh, after that. The only surviving Coulter portrait that is the primary subject is a pilot vessel is this of the Gracie S, pilot schooner number three, who was on station. I believe she was built Excuse me, I'm going to have to cross in front of your camera. I have to read my own notes. She was built in 1893 and didn't retire until 1947. So she was a pilot schooner here forever. She got famous later. She was Sterling Hayden's yacht, uh, the Wanderer. Uh, we made his famous getaway to Tahiti. And actually, she ran aground on Rangaroa Atoll in the South Pacific, uh, I think around 1964. Marcus, could you 
keep forgetting, but. Well, pilot schooner number three, every time I see number three, I think of the Gracie S, because she was here for so long, and I, again, I'm a big fan of Sterling Hayden's. I know the vessel well. <laughs> However, three brothers, when she was sailing, was well before the Gracie S was built, so I had to do a little homework, and number three before the Gracie S was the Boston pilot schooner, George Peabody. And so the Three Brothers is painted in a couple of versions with pilot schooner number two, which was the Caleb Curtis, but she was wrecked off Point Bonita and we believe was lost. <laughs> However, we have found out, or we do believe now, that the Caleb Curtis was rebuilt and went back into service as a pilot vessel after her, uh, her um, nearly sinking off Point Bonita. So we have two pilot schooners, number three. One is the George Peabody, and I should have the date that she stopped working in my head, but I don't. And starting in 1893, it was Gracie S was number three, and she stayed uh, as a pilot schooner until 1947. So the later versions is the Gracie S. I hope that sort of answered it. <laughs> this is Casco. This is probably one of the best known Coulter images because it's been reproduced so much almost. Uh, there are many prints of this that have been published. Uh, one of the first ones I ever saw was this. This, of course, uh, this belonged to Dr. William Merritt, I think his name was, Samuel. who was sorry, Samuel Merritt, excuse me. <clears throat> and again, uh, was made famous uh, several years after this painting was done because this was the vessel, of course, that Robert Louis Stevenson chartered to uh, for his voyage to the South Pacific. On this wall, we have several of the drawings that Coulter did for the San Francisco Call newspaper. He pretty much, there are thousands of these out there, but very few of them have survived. But he must have done one, at least one a day for the entire time that he worked for the, you know, for the San Francisco Call. Marcus, I'm going to correct you again. I, the family likes to think three per day. Three per day. <laughs> Nobody knows but Bill. That's what he probably sold one a day. <laughs> Here's three, pick one. <laughs> the others went to the Chronicle. Oh, never mind. So again, these are examples of his pen and ink work. We did come across a very interesting photo which shows the original call building. We just saw the skyscraper, the Spreckles call building going up in flames in the earthquake, but that is the original Inquirer building, uh, which before 1898, when the Call Spreckles building was built, was where the call was established, and Coulter started selling his paintings in this little building here uh, in the photograph that I've added. So each one of these, it's a story of something that happened in San Francisco on a specific day, specific time. And Coulter would just go around, find something interesting, and take what he had to the newspaper. And hopefully they would print a couple of samples of the actually ar actual articles are in the first two. More as a narration, this is the Pacific Mail steamship uh, City of Tokyo, bringing President Grant back to America after, his, uh, after Grant left office. He did a world tour. And this is Grant entering San Francisco with the, was quite a party with the entourage, all the boats full dressed with flags, the tug off the port bow of the city of Tokyo is the Millen Griffith. Moving along, little tug at sea. This is just kind of a tribute to the tugboats. I thought it was kind of cute. Uh, I shouldn't use that term as a curator, but if any of you remember the cartoon Little Toot when I was a kid, it was my favorite, and that reminds me of Little Toot. Yeah. How come that tugboat doesn't seem to be as sharply delineated in the picture? Coulter spent different amounts of time on paintings. We have paintings that are very sketchy. We have paintings that are absolutely, look at the one below it, almost photographic in its yeah. precision. Coulter, at a certain point, when he was supporting his family in particular, would paint into exhibitions where he would paint seven masterpieces, 10 that were great, you know, 15 that were mid-range, and then he would just knock out as many as he could for the general folks, you know. So you will see varying degrees of detail, of focus, uh, throughout Coulter's works. 
It shows that that's why this body of work, we have over a hundred culture paintings in this exhibition. And it just kind of features every aspect that I could come up with of William Coulter. So again, some really sharp, some more sketchy. Did you get his piece work by the call? Basically, by the picture. Excuse me? Did you get paid piece work by the call? Basically, by the picture that you took? He sketched, he sketched for the call as a freelance artist. Right. And if the call used his illustration, they would pay him $5, right. and he got to keep it. Not probably to sell to the Chronicle. <laughs> but he then would try to sell it or he'd just keep it. And I must say that the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park has the best collection of Coulter pen and ink drawings of anyone in the world, I'm sure. It's, it's magnificent. They're very difficult to keep. Oil paints are easy to preserve. But these things were painted quickly At this point, I should possibly explain that if I am missing some of your questions, I am extremely hard of hearing, and I'm not hearing them all, which is why I've got Tom as backup. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Speaking of Tom, here's one of uh, my favorite paintings that Tom owns. This is Return of the Whaling Fleet. This is probably done around the turn of the century. Right here, we have Arch Rock, which was a famous uh, hazard to navigation that was blown up in 1900. But after about mid-1890s, San Francisco was the whaling capital of the world, and we have the whale ships coming back in. So the habit the crew would lower the whale boats. They're all heading for the bars. The tug coming out to help start moving the vessels into their docks. Alcatraz Island, Angel Island, of course, Tamil Pius in the background. Yeah, just let the anchor down. Can you mention a word or two about the fort on Alcatraz? Can you, Sorry. Can you mention a word or two about the fort on Alcatraz? No, I okay. do not know that much oh, about okay. it. Par possibly some of the park rangers can. <laughs> I know Coulter painted it a lot. One thing I've always enjoyed about Coulter's paintings, many modern marine artists uh, paint, and they tend to over-canvas their vessels. This ship is rigged just perfectly for the condition she's in. She's jogging along under just her topsails. We've got a vessel coming in downwind that I think is kind of gambling with that forecourse down low. Most of the artists who portray ships today paint way too much canvas on them because it looked at such stirring romanticism. But uh, anybody who's been on board one knows that with that much wind and that much canvas, you're going to be losing mass pretty quickly. It's another very dramatic view. This is the uh, ship Gethsemane being towed off the rocks under Point Bonita. I initially looked at it, well, wait, she's towing out of the harbor. Why are they doing that? But she's been on the rocks. Her anchor's been dragging. There is a tow line there. The rig has to be struck because uh, the wind would just push her back on the rocks. So the tug's towing her out for, for maneuvering room. Now, the name of that tug is Relief, and Gethsemane... Again, she's a British bark that actually ran on the Australia trade. This painting, which I used, again, as the catalog cover and our entry panel, is, uh, again, one of his coming home views, but it shows the 1915 Pan American Exhibition. That was the 1915 World's Fair. It was a celebration not only of the anniversary of Balboa's discovery uh, of the Pacific Ocean, uh, 200th anniversary,